In an earlier video, we saw how we could create sets, and that by default, when we created set, the type of set that we got was an immutable set. So if we just did set one, two, three, the type that we got was a Scala collection immutable set of int. But we've seen that in the API, there are both mutable and in immutable sets. And so, for example, we had looked at the top level set here, but there are also the packages for immutable and mutable. And each of them has inside a set type. So there's the immutable set, and here is, if we come down, we also have the mutable set. So the question is, well, how do we get that mutable set? It happens to be in Scala collection mutable, and that's the key to being able to use it. We could, of course, type in scala.collection.mutable.set123. That seems rather verbose. Um, fortunately, the Scala is never needed because Scala.underscore is imported by default, but even that seems a little bit verbose. When you are going to use mutable types, kind of the style that is preferred is that you import Scala.collection.mutable. No dot underscore at this point. I'm just importing the package name. And then when I want a mutable set, I make it like this. And the reason for that is if I had made, if I had put dot underscore here, well then all sets would wind up being mutable. And you generally don't want that. I and mean, part of our goal, of course, is to be to use immutable data whenever we can. So this and, and also by default, someone reading your code is expecting set to be an immutable set. And so it can be very confusing if you do an import and you make it so that all of your sets are mutable. If the person doesn't notice that import, it will mislead them as far as what they think is going on inside of your code. So the recommendation is that you import the mutable package, and then every time you want to use a mutable set, you say mutable.set. Oh, it's very clear in your code that you're intentionally using the mutable version. So let's go ahead and let's give a name to this so I don't have to keep saying res. We'll call it mset, and it's going to be a the mutable set of one, two, three. And that really should have said set instead of, there we go, okay. That way I don't have to keep mistyping it through the rest of the video. So, I can actually do the same types of things that I did with our immutable set here, but those operations do not mutate. And that makes sense because both the mutable and immutable set are subtypes of the Scala collection set and the operations on that should all do the same thing. So because plus is creates a new set with that element added in the immutable version, plus really needs to do the same thing on the mutable version. However, the mutable version has methods that do assignment defined inside of it as well. So for example, if I do a plus equals for, you see that I get back the M set and it has been mutated. Okay, so the, the set that we had has now been altered and the four has been added to it. Uh, in this case, it happened to be added to the end, but mutable sets, I don't know if I will get lucky and adding a negative 10 will also, okay, right now they're just adding at the end, but set order, the order for sets whether they're mutable or immutable, doesn't matter, and is subject to change. It's possible the next edition of Scala would use a slightly different algorithm, and the order would be different. So you definitely can't assume ordering on these things. In addition to plus equals, I could take the M set, and I could subtract out the three, and now that has been removed. You might notice that each of these seems to return a value. Okay, and that is so that you can chain these things together. So I can take M set plus equals five, plus equals nine, plus equals 25. 
and they all get added into there. There is also a plus plus equals, and that takes a anything that is traversable. So it could be a sequence, it could be another set, uh, and it will add those things in. So for example, I could have 11, 12, 13, and it will add all of the contents of that traversable into it. That traversable happens to be a list sequence. Uh, you can call, now the thing about calling plus equals is that it does not tell you whether or not the thing was added. Instead, it gives you back the same set so that you can string these together. If you want to know if something was added, there is an add method. And so for example, if I call add on three, uh, I get, well I get true because I'd already removed three. Let's try adding it again, now I get false. Okay, so if I add something that was already there, it returns false. If I add something that is not there, I don't think we have 29 yet, I get true. Okay, we can look at mset to see that I have quite a few values in there. Because it's mutable, there is a method that will clear it out and really should be called with parentheses, though it will work either way. Now my mutable set has nothing inside of it. How about we come back up here and we add a few elements in there. You can also call remove, so just like there's an add that mirrors the plus equals, except it tells you whether or not it was there. There is a remove, and so if I try to remove six, it will return false to me. If I try to remove 11, it'll return true. And of course, the element is removed, just like with add, it, uh, it would have been added. There is another method called retain, and it is kind of similar to a filter. So remember that filter, so here, let's do m set plus plus equals one to 10, okay? So I just added in a range here, and all the elements from that range went in there, plus we already had 12 and 13, so they're still there as well. We don't have 11. The retain method is very similar to a filter, except filter can't mutate it. And if I call mset, and let's just say dot filter, and I'm gonna keep only the things that are even. If I call filter, I get back a new set, but my original set is, is still the same because the semantics of filter have to be the same whether the collection is mutable or immutable. Sometimes though, you do want to mutate this, and so there is also a retain method that's very much like the filter, except it doesn't give you back anything, and the reason is because it actually mutates the set. Okay, so it changed our M set so that it took out all of the odd elements. So, and of course you can, let's say six, you can index these things just like you uh, could with the immutable sets. You can also set things. So what happens if I say M set of three equals, now what would I set this to? Well, the indexing to kind of where it looks like you're pulling it out gives you back a Boolean. I can also set it to a Boolean, and now our M set has three, and if I were to set it to false, it would be removed. Okay, so you can do what looks like assignment. Remember that a call like this one is actually, where, whereas that is a call to apply, when you, it looks like an assignment, that is a call to update. So this is actually calling update three true when we add it back in. That kind of goes through the main ideas behind the mutable and immutable. Once again, key point, your import statement should be, you can choose whether or not you wanna put the Scala in front, but it should just be collection mutable. Do not put the dot underscore because then you're hiding the, immu the mutable set, now you're hiding the immutable set with the mutable set 
and you're going to make it harder for people to read your code and understand what's going on. Stopping here means that every time you want to use something that's immutable, you can just say mutable, or that you want to use every time you want to do something that's mutable, you can say mutable dot, and it, it's clear documentation in your code that you're using the mutable version of whatever it is. So far all we know about is sets, but we'll be seeing how we can do this with maps here shortly.